Good afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to um, introduce the topic of our first afternoon panel as well as our distinguished speakers. Um, the topic of our panel is lawfare and the Israeli-Palestine -Palest predicament. Um, so let me just briefly introduce uh, sort of what this topic is about, what our panelists will speak about. So as many of you probably know, at the end of 2008, Israel launched a three-week military offensive in the Gaza stri Strip called Operation Cast Lead. Um, the Gaza conflict sparked numerous allegations of uh, war crimes and international human humanitarian law violations by both Israel and Hamas. After the Gaza conflict, the Human Rights Council appointed a, a United Nations um, fact-finding mission led by the prominent jurist uh, Justice Richard Goldstone. The mission issued a report in September of 2009, uh, the infamous Goldstone Report, which concluded that both Israel and Hamas committed international law violations by indis indiscriminately targeting civilians. Now, the Goldstone Report uh, requested that the Security Council call on both Israel and Hamas to conduct investigations into war crimes allegations over the Gaza conflict. The report also recommended that if such investigations were not undertaken, then the Security Council sh should refer the Gaza situation to the International Criminal Court for a possible investigation. Now, the Human Rights Council has adopted has accepted the Goldstone, Goldstone Report's recommendations and has, has called upon all the parties to ensure um, their implementation. Um, the Goldstone Report, to the extent that its recommendations are implemented by the parties or used by, international, by an international tribunal like the ICC, can be seen as an illustration of lawfare. And as we heard throughout this morning, lawfare is basically a strategy of using or misusing law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve an operational objective. Now this panel will, uh, will discuss the impact of lawfare in conflict and combat as applied to the Israeli-Palestinian situation. Our first two panelists, Lori Blank and Mike Newton, to my left here, will discuss the Goldstone Report and will speak about the tactical use of lawfare to gain ad an advantage in combat situations, as well as about the principles of war as applied to the information struggle between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Our last two speakers, Bill Shabas and William Aceves, will address jurisdictional issues, such as the recent declaration by the Palestinian Authority to give jurisdiction to the ICC, as well as ongoing litigation in American courts under the Alien Tort Statute and other statutes involving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Let me briefly introduce our panelists and highlight some of their uh, achievements in the order in which they will speak. Um, Lori Blank, Blank teaches at Emory Law School. She's the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clin Clinic. Um, she works with students to provide assistance to international tribunals, um, as well as NGOs and law firms around the world on humanitarian law and human rights issues. Um, before coming to Emory, Lori Blank was a program director in the rule of law program at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She has authored uh, many articles, one of which is in your uh, materials for today. Mike Newton uh, is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School, and he came to Vanderbilt after serving in the Department of Law at the U.S. Military Academy. Uh, he has published over 60 articles, editorials, and book chapters in journals, um, very well-known journals such as, for example, the Cornell International Law Journal and the Virginia Journal of International Law. Uh, Mike Newton negotiated the elements of crimes documents for the ICC and also coordinated the interface between the FBI and the ICTY, the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, while in Kosovo to do uh, forensics field work to support the Milosevic indictment. He had also served in the Office of War Crimes Issues in the U.S. Department of State um, and also helped establish the Iraqi High Tribunal. Bill Shabas uh, uh, is a professor at the Irish Center for Human Rights at, National, at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, he hol holds many honorary degrees, one of which is from Case Western Reserve um, University. Um, he has authored, uh, according to, to what I have here, he's, uh, he's authored 275 articles in academic jur journals, as well as 21 books about uh, different issues in international law, international human rights law, international uh, criminal law. 
Um, in 2002, the president of Sierra Leone appointed Professor Shabas to the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission upon the recommendation of Mary Robinson, the UN High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights. Professor Shabas was named an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2006, and he was also elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2007. William Aceves is a Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at California Western School of Law. Uh, Professor Aceves works with Amnesty International, the Center for Justice and Accountability, the Center for Constitutional Rights, as well as the American Civil Liberties Union on projects involving the domestic application of international law. He is the principal author of the influential Amnesty International USA Safe Haven Report. Uh, Professor Aceves has appeared before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the UN Special Rapporteur on M Migrants, as well as the US Commission on Civil Rights. So without further ado, I will yield the floor to Lori Blink. Thanks, Melinda. Um, first, uh, I'd like to thank Mike Sharp and the organizers and sponsors of this event. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly about a very, I would say, one of the original conceptions of a lawfare, um, which is the strategic and tactical use or manipulation of the law as a tool um, during military conflict. And I guess I'd like to start by saying that I'm not going to talk about the Goldstone Report as lawfare in and of itself, although certainly it has been discussed that way. Rather, I'm going to talk about some of the aspects of the Goldstone Report um, and how it analyzes the uh, conflict in Gaza to demonstrate how it facilitates the use of lawfare. Um, I won't really comment on the report itself as as lawfare, as a, as a separate entity of lawfare. So in a tactical sense, what we're talking about here is how one side in a conflict may use violations of the law to gain a tactical advantage by handicapping the ability of the other side to carry out its mission within the bounds of the law. And the strategic side would be targeting public support to try to force an end to a conflict because of opposition to um, extensive civilian casualties or supposed violations of the law. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, highlighted in Operation Cast Lead, but, but even before, offers an um, unfortunate showcase for this, these types of issues. There hasn't been a conventional war fought in that area since 1973. Rather, we see fighting um, always within civilian populated areas, um, using um, all different types of, of um, techniques, but always involving commingling with civilians in highly populated areas, Gaza being the most densely populated area on Earth. The key issue that arises, um, I'm going to talk about three areas here today, all three of which are, have a, a significant effect on the fun, one of the fundamental principles of the law of armed conflict, and that's the principle of distinction. The principle of distinction states that all parties to a conflict must distinguish between those who are fighting and those who are not fighting and only target those who are fighting. It also says that those who are fighting must distinguish themselves from civilians, again, in order to protect civilians. The whole purpose of this principle is to ensure that only those who are fighting become targets of attacks and civilians are protected as much as possible from uh, the ravages of conflict. The um, conflict in Gaza posed enormous challenges for the principle of distinction. And the way that the law of armed conflict is applied in the Goldstone Report in investigating what went on during that conflict really impacts and dilutes the force of this principle in three main areas. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about here today. The first is perfidy. The second is military objectives, in particular protected objects such as hospitals and religious structures. And the last is uh, in the area of the defending party's obligations to protect the civilian population, to take precautions to protect civilians uh, during conflict. So on to the first one. Um, perfidy, the basic definition of perfidy is killing treacherously is leading the enemy to believe that one is entitled to protection under the law with the intent to betray that confidence. So 
It's a deliberate claim to, to legal protection for hostile purposes. A suicide bomber is a classic example. The person is dressed as a civilian. They obviously have a suicide bomber vest underneath. They gain access to a checkpoint because they look innocent. Sometimes they're using children, women, et cetera. Um, and yet, obviously, they blow themselves up. Um, that's a classic example of killing treacherously. This goes on. Um, there are other examples from Operation Cast Lead where um, Hamas militants were patrolling in civilian clothes, attacking in civilian clothes, and the, the effect of this is that the um, Israeli soldiers can't tell who is a civilian who merits protection and who is a fighter, a militant, whatever term you want to use, who is a lawful target, who is not only a lawful target but is posing a hostile threat to them. The effect of this, the only true effect of this, is that civilians are in greater danger all the time because they become both trapped in the conflict zone because they are caught up with militants who are trying, who are embedding themselves within the civilian population, and they become the unintentional targets of soldiers who mistake them for hostile threats and legitimate targets. What's terribly unfortunate in this report is that it doesn't mention perfidy. It mentions it once with regard to a particular incident involving Israeli soldiers on a separate issue. But with regard to this particular issue, which was so prevalent during the conflict, it doesn't mention it at all. The only result of this is that it essentially ratifies this behavior. It encourages it because it doesn't, not only does it not condemn it, it doesn't recognize it at all as problematic in the course of this conflict. And What's interesting is there was talk this morning about who do, with all this talk of lawfare, obviously it's being expanded to cover lots of different types of things, and we've heard discussion about which of those are, are appropriate. But there's a lot of talk that Western militaries portray themselves as, as the victims of lawfare. But I think what's important to remember is that it, the type of lawfare that I'm talking about, manipulating the law for tactical purposes in this way, the true victims are the civilians. And the civilians are the ones that the law, in many ways, is there and designed to protect. And so they are actually the victims of this type of behavior. Sure, the soldiers face the, the danger of not being able to figure out who's a, a threat, and so they're at greater risk, but, it's, but that, that's, that's their job in some way. It's the civilians who are caught up in this who are really the victims of this type of behavior. And the job of the law is to make sure that nobody is left without any protection. And so to not mention this type of behavior, to not condemn it and not recognize it and not ask and demand that it be stopped only endangers those civilians more because it, it encourages uh, groups to use this type of, these types of tactics. The second area uh, that I'd like to talk about has to do with military objectives. And a military objective is a object, a building, a bridge, etc. That is a lawful military target because of its nature, its location, or its use or its purpose. So an obvious example would be a munitions depot, um, a bridge that has a strategic value to the other side. That would, If you blow it up, it would keep the other side from crossing the river, etc. But in particular, for, for this discussion, I'd like to focus on buildings that are actually protected under the laws of war, that have special protection, such as hospitals and houses of worship. And for example, the Geneva Conventions in Article 18 of the, Gene of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it states that these buildings are given special protection. They cannot be targeted, and they cannot be used for military purposes in any way. And this is important, obviously, to uphold the ability of hospitals and, and, and religious houses of worship to serve their function, even during conflict. And yet, um, what happens in so many conflicts, not just in Gaza, is that these types of buildings get used for military purposes all the time. They get co-opted so that hospitals get used as uh, a command post, or mosques are being used to store munitions, rockets are being launched from mosques from hospitals, from schools, from other protected places. Uh, in, in Iraq, for example, the Iraqi regime parked airplanes uh, 
literally would park a fighter jet in between two residential buildings. Now, the residential buildings don't have this special protection, but they certainly are not military targets. They're just civilian residences. And they knew, the regime knew, that if it parked its fighter jet in between two houses, the US military was not going to target it because it didn't want to destroy the two houses. That's another example of this. Now, in the Goldstone Report, it talks about how Palestinian armed groups conducted attacks from these protected buildings, hospitals, mosques, etc. And it did mention that they should refrain from doing this. I believe that was the word that's used. It should refrain from doing this uh, because it is a violation of the law. However, the report stops there and it doesn't mention the fact that once this, these buildings are being used for these purposes, they lose their protection. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. And yet they still talk about how the Israeli attacks on these buildings were not lawful. And what that does is it, again, encourages these armed groups, or any, it does, doesn't matter which kind of group it is, it encourages the use of protected buildings for military purposes. Because even though it says they should refrain from doing it, even though the report says that um, it's not lawful to do so, it doesn't then condemn, I mean, it continues to condemn the attacks in response. And it doesn't, uh, a pro it doesn't provide an accurate analysis under the law of armed conflict of what happens to the nature of those buildings once they are being used for military purposes. And again, what this does is a, come back to greater endangerment for civilians. Civilians during conflict, like anybody else, they need the hospital. If they're wounded, anybody who's wounded needs the services of a hospital. If they can't go to the hospital, if they go to the hospital and become embroiled, located in a military target because the way the law is being applied doesn't protect that target anymore, the civilians are again in greater danger. The final area that I want to talk about today is the question of what precautions, what obligations the defending party has to take to protect the civilian population. We heard earlier this morning General Dunlap mentioned the obligation to, give, to take precautions in attack. We talked about the types of warnings that Israel um, provided during this conflict, which again were far in excess of any warnings that have ever been issued before. But what I'd like to talk about is the flip side. Just as the attacking party has an obligation to take precautions in attack, to where possible give advance warnings of attacks so that civilians who are in the area can try to find somewhere, uh, a place of safety, the defending party has an equal obligation to try to protect civilians from the effect of attacks. Both sides under Article 57 of Additional Protocol 1 have an obligation to take constant care. Um, this obligation extends throughout conflict. And the defending party's precautions often are given short shrift because it's so much easier to focus on what the attacking party has done. But the defending party, which usually has a greater ability in some ways to impact what the civilian population is doing because it's, it's their own civilian population, it's their area, has an obligation to to try to protect the civilian population from the effects of the attacks on them in a couple of different ways. One is to try to remove civilians from the vicinity of military objectives, um, and more importantly, to avoid locating military objectives in densely populated areas. So, in particular, um, in Operation Cast Lead, one of the main military objectives that Israel had or their key military objective was to stop the launching of rockets into southern Israel. So the actual rocket launchers themselves were a key military objective. They wanted to get rid of the rocket launchers. They wanted to eliminate the ability of Hamas and other groups to launch those rockets. To do so, you have to actually take out the launchers themselves. Where were these launchers located? They were located in mosques, in civilian areas, schools, right next to schools, in, in areas where they could be essentially embedded within the civilian population. It would be harder to find them and harder to target them. What's interesting is that the Goldstone Report doesn't even mention this particular provision of the Law of Armed Conflict, which is Article 58, Paragraph 2 of Additional Protocol 1. It doesn't mention this ever in the entire report. 
Um, to me, this is very problematic because not only does it not condemn this behavior, it doesn't uh, provide any support for the fact that Israel had a legitimate target in going after these rocket launchers, but it creates an incentive constantly for parties to use the civilian population as a shield. They're not being, um, the fact that they're doing this is not even recognized, let alone condemned. And so it just shows, um, it, it ratifies this behavior, it encourages it, and it facilitates it. I see that I'm just about out of time, but I think these three areas, in essence, by, by enabling this behavior, by not criticizing it, by not condemning it, the, um, the way the laws apply in the Goldstone Report has the effect of undermining the ability of the principle of distinction to protect civilians in warfare. And in essence, that was the report's goal, was to try to um, protect civilians. And unfortunately, it had the opposite effect in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Mike Newton. Thank you. Uh, well, let me add my voice to that that's thanking Michael. And I also want to, I, th I think it's a real, real uh, commendable thing that Case Western does every year. I mean, it's, it's a distinguished group of people that show up and the overflow room is full. Why? Because Michael puts on an outstanding conference every year. What makes it outstanding is, in, in large part, not those who come, but those who are here. So thank you all for your time as well, and particularly those in the overflow room. Um, what I want to do in, in the really short time we've got is to make a little bit of an effort to deconstruct. We keep talking about lawfare. What I want to do is to kind of deconstruct the terminological imprecision. Why do we misunderstand the term so much? And having laid that baseline, use the Goldstone Report to illustrate what I think are three of the most difficult challenges as we look at the future of lawfare. Um, I think it was said this morning, this term is not going to go away, this concept is not going to go away. So what I see myself doing is highlighting, how do you know lawfare when you see it? And more importantly, what should you as practitioners and as, and as lawyers and Justice Agola as judges uh, do about it? Um, I begin with, with a terminological imprecision by going back, the, the concept of lawfare, law as a surrogate for the conduct of warfare, has been talked about and written about and, and, and a lot of focus. I've not seen anywhere yet that goes back to the underlying basic principles of the law of war. The principles of war, which all military practitioners and any military commander is very familiar with, are taught in our academies. These are the fundamental tenets of how you conduct warfare. Things like objective and offensive and mass and economy of force and unity of command. Um, those are the basic principles that you can go back and track at a tactical level and a strategic level, and that's the mechanics of how you conduct effective warfare. If you look at lawfare through the prism of the, of the principles of war, you can immediately see why it, the term itself is subject to such diverse abuse. I mean, imagine unity of effort, unity of command among all, all the lawyers of the world, right? It just doesn't work. Um, the principle of offensive, and many times the law lends itself to defense as much as offense, and it's a difficult um, difficult challenge to say that law in every context is used to undermine the opponent's interests when in fact the very definition of international law is intended to create a uniform normative standard that applies equally. So it's hard to just take the law and properly say well it's only relative to the offensive and that's the only way I'm going to think about it. And I think that's at the heart of, of David's uh, discussion this morning as to what's different about the ICTY and the ICC because they're not that. Those institutions are created by definition to uphold the integrity of the law, not just to politicize the law. And I'll come back to that refrain in a minute. Uh, there is a very important undercurrent which has not been mentioned, and I really don't have time to get into it a lot, but I want to flag it for you because there's something here. Uh, there's, there's a lot here. There's a very important undercurrent between the practices of lawfare as we see and as we observe in the real world and the whole strain of tactical thought regarding counterinsurgency, regarding effective counterinsurgency. Um, I want to quote to you from a classic study, which I can send to you if you want. This was sort of a lost study that was resurrected a couple of years ago by a guy named David Galula, who some of you may not have heard of, others may have. Um, wrote a classic study for RAND in um, 
the name of it is Pacification in Algeria, 1956 to 1958. And it was his exploration as a commander in Algeria of counterinsurgency. Here's what he said. He said, if there was a field in which we were definitely and infinitely more stupid than our enemies, it was in propaganda. And what he's really saying is, if you put that in lawfare terms, what he's really saying is we were so focused on fighting the tactical battles in front of us that the larger domain of information operations and the legal domain and the tertiary and secondary ways that affected our combat operations, we overlooked those. And therefore, the enemy took advantage of those. By the way, if you're interested, um, in that old report are the seeds of some great writing, things like um, the importance of sealing borders. Boy, have we, have we learned that in Iraq. Uh, the importance of humane treatment. Uh, the, the fallacy of de just decapitating a terrorist network and thinking you've taken it out. All these things, this, we knew those lessons and we forgot them over time. Um, I agree with, with, with General Dunlap that the ethos of the professional lawyer is to serve the interests of the law and what that means, by definition, many times, is advising a particular client or a particular operator that that is unlawful. And here's how we bring that particular conduct in the correct pattern with the law. Um, the societies and the militaries that have been transparent about that, that operate on a basis of liberty, that operate on the, on the basis of the infusion of lawyers and the infusion of, of, of legal principles, those tend to be the most powerful and successful militaries around the world. Now, here, in my view, is the core definition of what lawfare really is and why it, in fact, is a real danger that we need to focus on. If you're faced with a powerful and effective military that is, that is buttressed by centuries of legal development in the laws and customs of war, the very essence of lawfare is to use the vehicle of legal norms to eviscerate that tactical capacity to undermine, to erode. This is why this morning it's been called asymmetric warfare. What you're doing is abusing the law, not for the purpose of enforcing military discipline, enforcing professionalism, enforcing mission efficiency, but actually as an offensive weapon to hinder and to corrode that. Uh, what's been termed in a recent article sort of stealth jihad. We're going we're gonna to erode um, appropriating the law, the power of the law, uh, as, as a way of extending our otherwise ineffective combatant activity. So I think, I think Laurie's done a really nice job in her article, in her yearbook article, which I commend to you, of going through the details of the Goldstone Report uh, to assess the implications of it with regard to specific tactical principles. So I don't want to do that. It's been done, and I don't want to duplicate her work. She did it better than I would anyway. But what I do want to do is to use the Goldstone Report in the, in the larger context of this conflict, and I think it's applicable to others, uh, to draw three principles of where lawfare really affects us, us the practitioners who care about the rule of law, where it really affects us and undermines our efforts to truly reinforce the, 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 the requirements of the law and the development of the law. Number one, successful lawfare succeeds in, in blurring lines, in creating, uh, in creating conflation of legal norms in a way that actually hinders the warfighter. I call this the, the superimposition of legal norms. Um, one example from the Rome Statute of the, of the International Criminal Court. Um, the, one of the crimes in the, in the Rome Statute is drawn from the 1899 Hague Regulations. It says verbatim from the 1899 Regulations that you may not intend, uh, destroy civilian property unless it's imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. Fair enough, 1899 Hague language. Um, in the negotiations then, there's this effort to say, well, the 1899 phrase, imperatively demanded by the necessities of war, means, follow me now, necessary military necessity. In other words, it's not enough to have military necessity. Now we're going to introduce a sliding scale of post hoc post hoc subjectivity to import criminality, even where there is no mens rea on the basis of a subsequent. You see the problem with that for war fighters? If any destruction of any civilian property under any circumstances is subject to the after effect, without any mens rea judgment of somebody else post hoc on a very sliding subjective scale, it means 
that every destruction of civilian property in every circumstance will be deemed criminal by somebody in almost every, in every circumstance. And, and, if, and if that's the case, what do you tell the young rifleman who's looking at, a, at the barrel of a gun and is forced to take action to accomplish the mission? It's, that's lawfare. To the extent that you paralyze those war fighters through a, through, a, through a watering down of the law, that's lawfare. Um, another example, uh, investigative authority. The Goldstone Report spends a long time talking about the legal obligation to investigate allegations of war crimes, to which all the military practitioners in the room say, amen. That's the essence of a professionalized military that takes the laws and customs of war, imports it into their practice, and in fact, when they're violated, enforces them. Why? As a necessary predicate to a disciplined, professional fighting force that is focused upon the mission. In fact, that's the very essence of command. That's what a commander is, by definition. Somebody who's able to orchestrate violence to achieve a common criminal or a common uh, operational purpose in a way that's not criminal. And that's why we have the laws and customs of war. That's why Yusin Bello developed for that purpose. The obligation to investigate in that context comes from the very essence, the very definition of military command. It does not come from human rights norms. It does not. And so to conflate that means that after the fact, what we're really doing is taking away any discretion from a military commander to say, I've looked at that treatment, I've looked at that, that complied with my command judgment, that complied with the rules of engagement, my lawyer tells me that was legal, therefore I'm not going to investigate. Let me give you one practical example of why this is important. If we apply human rights standard, um, and this is in the Goldstone Report, that what you need to do anytime there's any allegation, any incident that might be a violation of the laws and customs of war, you need to take the weapons involved and obviously take them out of the fight, subject them to forensic analysis. Why? That's because that's what we do. Now try saying that to an infantry company commander fighting through Fallujah, right? The second there's any indication that might be a borderline violation, you're going, to, you're going to freeze the halt, you're going to take those weapons. It's, it's impractical. And again, that's the essence of lawfare, to take legal norms and twist them to, to <coughs> impinge combat operations in a way that, that, that you, you have achieved a combatant superiority in a way that you couldn't achieve with the kinetic uses of force. The second big issue, and this is a closely related but separate issue, um, lawfare in its purest form imports a very absolutist approach. It's either right or it's wrong, and there is no middle ground, and it's all done based on a subjective post hoc evaluation. Um, Laurie mentioned, and it was mentioned this morning, the warning requirement. Let me read to you uh, Protocol 1 verbatim on the warning requirement. This is what it says. Effective advance warning shall be given of attacks which may affect the civilian population, and then as in so many other places of the laws of war, there's room for a margin of appreciation, is what we would say in human rights norm, a, a, a deference to the reasonable commander, a recognition that the realities of combat operations are not so neat and linear and bright line. Rec uh, warnings shall be given unless circumstances do not permit. What the Israelis did in Gaza was to send two million flyers, to, to make telephone calls, to use loudspeakers, a whole variety of ways, and has been said in my observation and what I know of the laws and practices, nobody's ever done it that way before. Nobody's ever taken the care, and yet, when you build in a bright line absolutist principle, that's what a lawfare would do, nothing is good enough. What you've done is you've taken the normative meaning of the law, which gives the commander, a reasonable commander, room to act appropriately under the circumstances and you've taken that away. In that way, using lawfare, you've hindered, you've <coughs> impacted the combat operation. Number three, and I think for those of us who are practitioners in the field of international criminal law, this is the one that hits the closest to home. And it's the, the co-opting, uh, the politicization, if you will, of an enforcement accountability process. I do not agree, as I, as I think has been said, with the statement that any effort to enforce the norms of international law is automatically lawfare. That's not lawfare. That is the normative enforcement of a universalized 
articulated, understood principle. And in fact, when we have done that, those who violate those principles need to be held accountable. That's not the question. The question is, are we using lawfare, are we using a particular process, whether it's the International Criminal Court or the ICTY or the, IC, or the Sierra Leone Special Court, as a way of co-opting the law to aid and abet the subver subversion of sovereign interests? Are we using this subterfuge? And does this sound familiar? This is Goering's argument at Nuremberg. This is the whole victor's justice strain of logic. And the correct answer for those of us who practice in this field is to say no, there's a political dimension. These, uh, these, these forums are established using political processes, but the operation of the law, the enforcement of the norm, is not a political process. It's a judicial process, and to the extent that we allow the legal regime to be co-opted, um, what we're really doing is not allowing the law to be enforced, but allowing it to be eviscerated. What we're really doing is permitting that politicized forum to be eviscerated. And this is one of the fundamental problems with the Goldstone Report going forward, because it has led to the perception that the ICC is nothing more than the fallback for politics. And I think that's a real problem going forward. So let me end very quickly with where I started, which is, what do you do as the practitioner? Can I make a difference? <clears throat> Highlighting these trends, knowing that the law is in fact being undermined, I think David Galula, who was in his day one of the most well-respected counterinsurgency scholars, his work is brilliant. If you go back and read it, it's just brilliant. And it was forgotten. David died at the height of the buildup in Vietnam. And there's no doubt in my mind that with his influence and his, his insight into effective counterinsurgency, David would have made a difference in Vietnam, in the Vietnam conflict. And by extension, a difference in U.S. military doctrine. Those of you who are lawyers and practitioners in this field, knowing that your fidelity is to the integrity of the law, watch for, countermand, you lend your intellectual weight to the efforts to stand on the side of the integrity of the law. The fundamental principles themselves, not allowing the law to be used and perverted as a vehicle for impeding tactical operations, because that is the essence of lawfare, and that's what we have to watch for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie and Mike, for these comments on the Goldstone Report as well as on the concept of lawfare. And hopefully our audience will have a chance to ask some more questions about these at the end of the panel. Um, now we'll turn to uh, Bill Shabas and then William Aceves, who will speak to us more about the use of the courts, uh, both the ICC and then the um, American courts in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Bill. Thank you very much. Um, let me also uh, thank Michael Scharf for um, the invitation to come once again to CASE and to uh, participate in these wonderful conferences uh, which have contributed so much over the years on various subjects. Uh, the crime of aggression was one, genocide. Um, I was, I think like some of the other speakers, a bit uh, uneasy about the title of this one because it does have a pejorative uh, tone, the idea of war, of, of lawfare. And uh, coupled with the fact that on the publicity material there was that rather um, stunning quotation from Netanyahu about how the three threats to the three greatest threats to the survival of Israel were now I can't remember what the first two were but the third one was Richard Goldstone uh, the Iranian nuclear program uh, Iranian rockets, nuclear weapons rockets aimed at our civilians rockets and, and you know Goldstone yeah. Um, <laughs> And I had people uh, approach me uh, knowing I was coming here, thinking that this was going to be a, a Goldstone bashing thing. Frankly, if I had to um, think of the, an individual who would be the greatest threat to the survival of Israel, um, I'd probably choose Netanyahu. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and, and not Goldstone. Um, I think um, I, I was going to speak about the International Criminal Court and the, the fact that under uh, Article 12, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute, the Palestinian Authority has given uh, jurisdiction or attempted to give jurisdiction to the court. And I'll, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll get to that. But I really do feel that I have to uh, step in and, and say a few words in defense of, of Richard Goldstone and of the Goldstone Report. It would be a shame if uh, 
this conference left the impression, left such a negative impression about, about what he's done um, and his contribution. I, I don't think that lawfare is at all an appropriate term, at least in its pejorative uh, context, to describe um, what that report is about. It's not about trying to impede tactical operations. It's not about trying to manipulate law. Um, first of all, the idea of lawfare, or warfare for that matter, suggests that you're on one side or another, and I don't know how one could say that about Richard Goldstone, a man of, it's hard to think of a, of a public personality of such integrity as Richard Goldstone and the, the role he's played. Uh, I think he, he's, he certainly didn't go into this uh, difficult job, uh, difficult for him personally as well as those of you who followed uh, his involvement, as you know, he's a Jew who often visited Israel. Uh, he, won't, he won't go back to Israel. He probably can't for personal safety. Um, he's, uh, he's undergone all kinds of uh, very unhappy consequences as a result of doing something that the rest of us will be fortunate if we get to do in our lives, which is to show the kind of courage he did in stating his opinions honestly and, and in a forthright manner, which is what's in the report. What the report's main conclusion is, of course, is that the cast lead, Operation Cast Lead, was a punitive action and it was aimed to punish the people of Gaza. And that's not an unreasonable conclusion for someone to, um, to reach. If we look at the poor people of Gaza, who are now into, what, the third or the fourth generation living in refugee camps, living in one of the most populous and impoverished parts of the world, and all they want is a state, and they get punished for insisting upon this and for um, uh, supporting a political party in their own determination and their own assessment that seems to be representing that aspiration. Um, and Goldstone looked at the facts that that, that Operation Cast led. I don't have the numbers at, at, at my fingertips because as I say, I was planning to speak on something else, but were there, what, 1,300 or 1,400 deaths in Operation Cast Lead? Is that about right? And how many of them were civilians? About 1,000? And how many of those were children? Three or 400? I forget the exact numbers. I'm speaking from memory, but it's of that order of magnitude, and I don't remember how many Israeli civilians were killed in Operation Cast Lead, but I don't think there were very many. Were there any? Civilians? No. Not one. And how many have been killed from the rockets? Three? 300 children? 400 children killed? And so the Goldstone Report looks at this and says, it looks like a punishment operation. It's a very helpful thing for us that we have someone like Richard Goldstone who can look at a conflict like this and draw legal conclusions about it and suggest that both sides are violating um, the laws of war and human rights obligations that they have. And the debate about human rights obligations, uh, whether they're ap applicable in the, in the territory such as Gaza in a situation of conflict is an interesting technical question. I think there's one small example in the report where there's a finding of a human rights violation and a killing where it wasn't also deemed to be a war crime. This is really a, a detail. It's, not a, it's a detail that shouldn't detract us from um, observing the, and, and understanding the, the great wisdom of the whole report. I think on the other, uh, and I, I did read this morning, I hadn't received Laurie's paper before, the, 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 before today, but I did, uh, and I apologize to the speakers who were speaking while I was reading the report this morning, but I, I couldn't resist reading it, and I went through the objections. At first I thought that it was a case of what I'd call praising with faint dams, um, because in the end, it didn't really strike any serious blows to the main import of the Goldstone Report, which is the violations of international law committed by the Israeli Defense Forces. Didn't really, maybe a couple of glancing blows, but the thrust, and you heard it in her presentation a few minutes ago, was mainly, well, exclusively about the behavior of Hamas was about the other side. So maybe Hamas didn't behave properly. I don't think anyone has any doubts about that, and nor does Goldstone, and it's in the report. But it doesn't really address, doesn't challenge 
in any significant way the conclusion that Israel in re violated international law and that this resulted in the deaths of approximately a thousand civilians, including many, many children, and that's out of all proportion to anything that happened to Israel on the other side. In terms of the specific conclusions, I'm even not really very convinced by the, by the specific points. Um, the accusation of perfidy, I'm not sure that it's a, there are many experts in international humanitarian law in the room, much more expert than I am, but my understanding of perfidy, that it was essentially uh, trying to, uh, using some sort of a ruse or a trick to get the other side, to induce the other side to, to um, uh, in, in order to respect the law, to put themselves at a great disadvantage or in a, in a vulnerable situation. And, and the section in, in your paper, Laurie, that talks about this, I think you actually concede this, um, fighting without uniforms but using mortars and other weapons isn't really perfidy. That's just being a combatant who's not wearing a uniform. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't know that the failure to condemn perfidy is, a, is a, a fatal flaw in the Goldstone Report. The fact that they haven't cited perfidy specifically, or they did in one place, or they didn't specifically mention Article 58 of the first protocol. Um, these, are, these are, I think, details. I think they're, they're quibbles. Nobody's perfect. The report isn't perfect. It has its own shortcomings and flaws, but it's a fundamentally um, positive, helpful contribution to moving this uh, issue forward. Um, I think that one of the problems with it, and, uh, and not just with the comments about the Goldstone Report, but more generally with this issue of Palestine, but there are others as well, is that we want to use law to help bring peace and to resolve conflicts. Um, we're usually doing it in a situation, and I'm always intrigued by the use of the word asymmetry. Of course, I guess when it's asymmetry, both sides are at fault. But if when we're looking to use the word asymmetrical to describe the situation in Palestine, it's really not the poor Palestinians who are the authors of asymmetry to the extent that anybody can be responsible for it. But they are um, uh, in an extremely, and always have been, terribly vulnerable uh, situation. But I, I was thinking there are other conflicts that we might address. We've seen in recent, uh, recent months, actually, attempts to solve Kosovo using law. And it led to an advisory opinion at the International Court of Justice. Cyprus is another case that comes to mind where there's been a lot of, we could have another panel on, on Cyprus and the conflict there. And finally, uh, Northern Ireland and the <coughs> Irish government asymmetrically because Ireland is not going to go to war with the United Kingdom. That would be asymmetry. You know? <laughs> that would not be a wise thing. All, all Ireland could do when it wanted to get the British to behave themselves in Northern Ireland was go to court. So that was lawfare. Maybe that was one of the first examples. Um, and so when we look at the situation in Palestine, I think we all hope that maybe a legal way can f help us find our way out of it which is why we should encourage developments like the Goldstone Report and welcome them and welcome the fact that we're using law to try and find solutions. The, uh, do I have a minute or two left? The, the subject that I was, to, I was going to speak to you in more detail about is Article 12, <laughs> Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute, which has been invoked by the Palestinian Authority to give uh, jurisdiction to the International Criminal Court. It's a curious provision in the Rome Statute. It's a bit of a remnant, really, um, because it, it's, it's uh, like all negotiations, you, you move forward in developing an instrument or a, or a model, and that's what happened with the Rome Statute, and you have little bits from the old, outdated part of it that just linger on, and that's what happened. What Article 12, Paragraph 3 does is, is it allows a state that's not a member of the court, that hasn't ratified the statute, to give jurisdiction to the court without joining it. And although it's a bit of an, an anomaly in a way, it's, I think, a very helpful provision. It's proven to be useful, and I think it will be in the, in the future, because it enables a state that joins the court to say, we join it as of today, but we're actually going to give jurisdiction to the court in the past. 
Um, and one country has done that. Uganda did that. Uganda made such a declaration. Why this is so useful is that it helps us to send a message to all states that there's nothing in the world that can't potentially come before the International Criminal Court. One of these years, David Sheffer's efforts are going to pay off and the United States will ratify the Rome Statute. And it could give jurisdiction retroactively up to the beginning of the court, which will be the 1st of July 2002. And I think that's a very useful, helpful message to send out so that nobody, that all that can do is contribute to uh, ending impunity for human rights. Are you telling me I'm, I'm no, no? I'm looking at I'm my I'm just watch. looking for a sign up there. Oh, I still got two minutes, that's great. All that can do is, uh, is, uh, is encourage that. So um, I'd like to think that I might be even uh, responsible uh, way back in the past for the Palestinian Declaration because in my book, The Introduction of the International Criminal Court, uh, I wrote a paragraph on this potential use of, of Article 12, Paragraph 3, and I said, maybe the Palestinian Authority could make a declaration saying that when they are a state, they will ratify the Rome Statute and they will give jurisdiction to the court over their territory going back to the 1st of July 2002. I thought that would be a helpful message, might focus the mind of uh, some of the Israeli soldiers and the, their leaders on the possibility that they'd be prosecuted. So um, they went one step further and actually made such a declaration. So now there's a great debate going on about whether the declaration is valid, the central issue being is Palestine now a state because the Rome Statute says you have to be a state to make the declaration. Those of you who are interested in reading more on this, if you go onto the website of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, there's a detailed explanation. Um, there's an analysis of the various submissions and then you have all the submissions that have been given to the International Criminal Court by some of the most notorious practitioners of lawfare in the world. Law professors, even my name pops up there on one of the <laughs> statements because I signed a, a, a number of European, mainly European law professors, signed a, um, a paper, a, a, an opinion, where we advanced the view that for the purposes of the Rome Statute, maybe we should have a purposive and somewhat flexible functional approach to the definition of a state, um, so as to expand the possibility of the jurisdiction of the, of the, of the court and said that under those circumstances, even if perhaps in some certain technical senses, Palestine didn't meet the definition of a state, that nevertheless it was desirable that the court, the, the prosecutor in the first place, give a fairly liberal uh, approach to this. But there are pre people on the other side, one practitioner of lawfare I noticed was named John Ashcroft. Uh, he, he may be a familiar name here, and he signed one of the opinions, and there are many others. They're on all ends of the spectrum, so it's actually very interesting to read. You've got all of the views out there, and you can reach their own conclusion. We don't know what will happen. Uh, the prosecutor has suggested that in the next few months there will be a decision as to whether or not to uh, accept this conclusion. He would still have to then go to a pretrial chamber. He would first have to decide that he wants to prosecute and then go to a pretrial chamber. So I, I don't think that the Israeli generals are trembling in their boots and thinking that they'll be prosecuted anytime soon. But it's probably better that we move forward on this than that we, we don't do it. It's going to help bring peace and help save lives, which is the goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. William. Great. Thanks. Uh, I want to first join the parade of panelists who have acknowledged Professor Scharf and Case Western and the Journal of International Law for putting this conference together. My colleagues have addressed the lawfare critique from an international perspective, and I'm going to focus more on it from a domestic perspective. Specifically, I'm going to examine how the lawfare critique has been applied in relation to lawsuits filed in U.S. courts by victims of human rights abuses. Uh, it's not surprising that victims of the Arab-Israeli conflict would seek redress for their injuries in any conceivable forum. The scope of suffering, the diverse number of nationalities affected by that conflict, and the challenge of pursuing claims in the countries where their harms were inflicted, these factors have all contributed to pushing victims to any conceivable forum to pursue justice for their injuries. In fact, several lawsuits have been filed in U.S. courts by individuals who have been harmed in attacks linked to that conflict. 
The lawsuits raise a number of claims, most of them based on international human rights law. And the plaintiffs are typically innocent victims caught in the repetitive cycle of violence that has typified the era of Israeli conflict. Some of the victims are specifically targeted. Others are unintentional victims, euphemistically referred to as collateral damage. The lawfare critique raises a number of challenges to this litigation. It questions the motives of plaintiffs. It challenges the legitimacy of their claims. It asserts that law is being used for political purposes. While it offers an intriguing and provocative rhetorical critique, the lawfare moniker ultimately misses the mark because it fails to recognize that the central purpose of law and of any legal system is to offer a viable alternative to the use of force and a mechanism for victims to seek redress for their injuries. Legal fora should remain accessible to victims who should have the right to bring claims for redress. And even lawsuits that are ultimately dismissed can serve a purpose for victims, publicizing their plight, and forcing defendants to respond in some capacity. I'm going to try to address three issues in my remarks. First, as I noted, I'm concerned that the lawfare critique undermines the growing movement to provide a right to address to victims of human rights abuses. Second, I argue that the lawfare critique could be used to challenge a wide range of lawsuits, including lawsuits filed by victims of terrorism. And third, I have concerns about uh, the lawfare critique because it could be used to pose significant limitations in a democratic society based on the rule of law. At its most extreme, the lawfare critique would preclude the use of law to resolve conflicts or restrict the role of lawyers in conflict resolution, a puzzling proposition. But as was noted this morning, this very outcome was uh, recently accepted by the US Supreme Court early this year in Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project. As I noted, I'm concerned about the lawfare critique uh, because I believe it undermines the growing movement to a right to a remedy. And we can trace this movement to the earliest uh, international instruments of the 20th century. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, codified the right to a remedy. It appears in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Indeed, the right to a remedy appears in virtually every multilateral and regional human rights instrument. More recently, a number of UN documents, including the 2005 UN Basic Principles and Guidelines on the Right to a Remedy and Reparation, provide that victims of gross violations of international human rights are entitled to equal and effective access to justice, adequate, effective, and prompt reparations for harms suffered, and access to relevant information concerning violations and reparation mechanisms. At a minimum, victims should have a right to access legal systems and an opportunity to present their claims before a neutral tribunal. The lawfare critique would pose limits on the right to a remedy and therefore it is contrary to that continuing development in international law that seeks to provide a right to remedy to victims. In the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, most of the lawfare critiques have focused on litigation filed by Palestinian or Lebanese plaintiffs against Israeli government officials or related entities in U.S. courts. The Matar, Belhas, and Corey line of cases are most closely associated with the lawfare critique. In Matar v. Deter, victims of a 2002 Israeli Defense Forces aerial bombing in Gaza City filed a lawsuit against Abraham Dieter, who was the head of the Israeli security agency. In Belhas v. Ya'alon, victims of the 1996 IDF bombing of the UN compound in Kana, Lebanon, filed a lawsuit against Lieutenant General Moshe Ya'alon, who was the head of the IDF Army Intelligence. In Corey v. Caterpillar, relatives of several individuals who were killed uh, by IDF forces, including uh, the family of a U.S. activist who was killed by an IDF bulldozer, filed a lawsuit against Caterpillar Inc., a U.S. corporation that had sold the bulldozers to the IDF. Each of these lawsuits was dismissed, albeit on different uh, grounds. Matar and Belhas were dismissed on immunity grounds. Corey was dismissed under the political question doctrine. The lawfare critique argues that these lawsuits were filed solely for political or strategic purposes. Critics have asserted that the plaintiffs had no expectation that they would win when they filed these lawsuits. Critics have also noted that the lawsuits failed to achieve their legal objective of providing redress for victims. And they've even asserted that the litigation has undermined the human rights movement. Now, while the lawfare critique has generally been used to challenge these types of lawsuits filed against Israeli government officials or related entities, it could also be applied with equal force to lawsuits filed by victims of terrorism in U.S. courts. 
Several lawsuits have been filed against Palestinian entities, including the Palestinian Authority and the Palestine Liberation Organization for acts of terrorism. Numerous lawsuits have been filed against Iran for its support of terrorist groups. In the states of Unger v. Palestinian Authority, for example, a U.S. citizen and his Israeli wife were killed in a terrorist attack in Israel by members of the Hamas Islamic Resistance Movement, which was subsequently designated a terrorist organization by the Department of State. In 2000, the Unger family filed a lawsuit in the United States under the Anti-Terrorism Act against several defendants, including Hamas, the PLO, and the Palestinian Authority, and ultimately that lawsuit was successful. Uh, it was a default judgment granted in their favor. In Flato, the Islamic Republic of Iran, a U.S. national, Alyssa Flato, was killed in a, a, a terrorist uh, attack, a suicide bombing in Israel. <coughs> Palestine Islamic Jihad, an organization funded by the Iranian government, claimed responsibility for the attack. In 1997, Alyssa Flato's father brought a lawsuit against the Iranian government and several Iranian officials in the United States. And that lawsuit was filed under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And ultimately, the plaintiffs uh, were successful in that case and received a very significant judgment. Each of these lawsuits was filed against a political actor, including the Palestinian Authority and the Iranian government. They were each filed in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Damages were sought not only to compensate the victims' families, but also to deter similar acts in the future. But was the Unger family using law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve military objectives? Was the Flatow family using the law as a weapon of war? If the lawfare critique is valid, it would apply with equal force to these lawsuits. Now there is of course a distinction between the Matter Bailhouse Caterpillar cases and the Unger Flatow line of cases. The Unger Flatow plaintiffs were successful, whereas the Matar Bellhouse Caterpillar plaintiffs were not. But should the legitimacy of the lawfare critique be decided by the outcome of the litigation? A human rights critique of these cases would question why one group of victims were successful and another were not entitled to relief. Extending the lawfare critique, uh, um, I wanted to briefly address the Supreme Court's early decision in uh, a recent decision in Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project. As I noted, one of the most ominous aspects of the lawfare critique is the inference that law should not be used by victims to seek redress for their injuries or that lawyers should not be allowed to counsel their clients on their rights or on available forums to pursue their rights. And yet this outcome was essentially sanctioned by the Supreme Court in the Holder decision early this year. In Holder, two U.S. citizens and six organizations filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the material support statute, the terrorism material support statute. The plaintiffs in that case sought to pursue several activities, including training one of those organizations on how to use humanitarian and international law to peacefully resolve disputes and how to petition various representative bodies, such as the United Nations, for relief. The plaintiffs wanted to provide that type of, of information to, uh, in particular, two organizations, the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, and the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. Both of those organizations were designated terrorist organizations by the United States Department of State. The, mil the material support statute prohibits knowingly providing material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization. A companion statute defined material support or resources to include expert advice or assistance. And the plaintiffs raised both First Amendment challenges and Fifth Amendment challenges to that statute. Ultimately, the Supreme Court granted cert uh, and in June of this year issued its decision. The court upheld the constitutionality of the material support statute as applied to the specific forms of support that the plaintiffs sought to provide the organizations. The court noted that the statute did not prohibit the plaintiffs from speaking or writing freely about the PKK and LTTE, the governments of Turkey and Sri Lanka, human rights and international law. The court emphasized the plaintiffs were free to do that. However, the court found that the statute prohibited the plaintiffs from providing these terrorist organizations with material support, which covers a narrow category of speech to, under the direction of, or in coordination with foreign groups that the speaker knows to be terrorist organizations. Thus, the plaintiffs could not teach members of designated groups how to use humanitarian law, how to use international law to peacefully resolve disputes. 
The court was concerned that foreign terrorist organizations could use the international legal system to threaten, manipulate, and disrupt. These groups could use peaceful negotiations as subterfuge, as a means of buying time to recover from short-term setbacks, lulling opponents into complacency, and ultimately preparing for renewed attacks. The courts found the plaintiffs could not teach these groups how to petition international bodies like the United Nations for relief because such speech teaches the organization how to acquire relief. And I don't have time, uh, but Justice Breyer had a very powerful uh, dissent in that case. Uh, it seems clear to me that the Supreme Court and Holder accepted the assertion that law essentially can be used as a weapon of war. Thus, the plaintiffs could not train a terrorist group on how to use humanitarian law, how to use international law, to peacefully resolve their disputes. In addition, the plaintiffs could not teach these groups on how to petition international bodies for relief or assistance. According to the court, such actions could aid a group in its military operations. In the face of such an intractable conflict as the Arab-Israeli conflict that has lasted for decades and cost thousands of lives, we should see the law as an ally rather than as an enemy, and we should view lawyers as promoters of peace and not as weapons of war. Courts should remain accessible to victims of human rights abuses, and the success or failure of these lawsuits should not be used to measure their legitimacy. The rule of law offers us a powerful mechanism for ending violence, and we should be wary of any efforts to limit its use. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I have to observe that this panel, even though it was um, originally conceived as a you know, traditional panel, has turned into somewhat of a crossfire panel. And luckily for me, sitting here in the middle, the weapons are words and not bullets. Otherwise, you know, may lo no longer be here. Um, I do believe we have time for a few questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please um, come up to a microphone and please identify yourself before asking your question. Hi. Is it okay if I just make a small comment? Not a question, it will take one second. I think that the, uh, the, 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 this panel is very successful uh, uh, because the, uh, at least the first and the last speakers identified the same problem, a problem that I've sensed is going on since this morning, which is, uh, and which was stated very clearly by uh, Gents, is it? Gents. There's a difference, it seems to me, between legal process and lawfare. You have a, a, a right to a legal remedy. And I think that lawfare is not the same as law. There's nothing wrong with prosecuting an alleged criminal. Uh, and I think that the positive connotations of the lawfare term which I disagree with. I, I only see negative connotations, and I think we're all talking about the same thing, and I think we're all agreeing with, that, with each other because we're failing to really make the distinction here today between legal process and lawfare. And second point, there is a difference between going to law, to the legal process, uh, for a legitimate purpose, or using the law as a subterfuge to work together with the media to draw negative public opinion about your enemy. And that element of the negative public opinion, the use of the media, it's been mentioned briefly here in the subtext. We need to develop that because that is, I think, the essential element of the definition of lawfare that, that we really are missing in, in all of this. Other than that, I thought this was a great panel. Mike. <laughs> I, I like that because you agreed with what I said. I, I like that. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you um, more. But, but let me add one two finger. Um, and I think this does kind of illustrate the problem. Uh, I think I may be the only person, or at least I'm the only person here that I know of that actually testified at the Goldstone Commission. And let me say, I agree with Bill's assessment of Richard. Just, you know, for those who know this, he's a prince. This was not his intent to create a controversy. His intent was to do exactly that was to set forth, to the best of his ability, a very courageous act. And that's why he went back, which, which hasn't been mentioned, and, and tried to clarify the, in the very beginning, tried to clarify the, the mandate to be even-handed. The problem then becomes, 
the perception and the reception and the abuse and misuse of those results. And I think that is a public, public domain, which says to me it reinforces my central premise that it's for the lawyers of the world who know what the law is, know the way it was intended to operate, and know how it should be to stand up and say that effort, this, this dimension is political, is manipulation, et cetera, that effort is a good faith application of the law, and to fight back against that kind of media misuse or, in fact, the misuse by the parties, which is also common. I think that's what the lawyer ought to be doing. Thank you. Um, okay, my, my question is for uh, Mr. Newton and, and Ms. Blank. Okay. Uh, basically, it, it, it was brought up that uh, leaflets were, were, were thrown in Gaza and, and also that... Uh, that the that the schools and hospitals that that that, that they were firing weapons for, from that. No, no. One of the uh, uh, requisites for for a just war, a, a just ad bellum, is that uh, war should should only be used as a last resort uh, to to. To, a, a, as a remedy for, for, for the aggrieved party. So, so it's like uh, Khaled Meshal, the uh, prime minister of Palestine, o o offered Israel a 20-year a, a truce or, or, or hodr in, um, in the Arabic language. Uh, it's, a, it's a truce. Uh, so if, if the rockets could, could be stopped from, from going into... Uh, Steroid and um, and Beersheba, but, but but by means of uh, of agreeing to to a truce, uh, do, doesn't that make uh, the, the the phosphorus bombs and the and the and the bombing of uh, of Gaza and and the whole siege uh, do, doesn't that constitute a war crime? question, it's important to realize that there are two bodies of law that you're, um, that are involved in your question. One is the use ad bellum, which governs the resort to force, whether or not a country is using, resorting to force lawfully, is going to war within the bounds of the law. That's the question of whether or not you're acting in self-defense or is it an aggressive war. It's entirely separate from the question of the use in bella, which is the law that governs the conduct of the war. The fact that a country may engage in an aggressive war or a war of self-defense or any other type of war doesn't impact the lawfulness or unlawfulness of their conduct of hostilities. They're two totally separate questions. The fact that, for example, Germany engaged in an aggressive war, which is one of the findings at Nuremberg, didn't mean that they lost the rights and privileges or didn't have to abide by their obligations under the laws of war. They, German prisoners of war were still entitled to protection when they were captured by Allied forces, even though Germany was engaged in an aggressive war. The fact that the um, Allies were, in essence, fighting against an aggressive war didn't mean that they could disregard their obligations under the laws of war. So the question of whether Israel's, um, whether Operation Cast Lead was a lawful use of force doesn't impact whether or not specific incidents during the war were lawful under the law of armed conflict. And to conflate them creates a situation in which um, judgments about the entire operation infect judgments about the particular tactics used or particular attacks launched, or vice versa, that conclusions about a range of a number of particular attacks will then infect the judgment about whether or not the use of force was lawful. One of the key principles of this entire body of law is that those two must remain separate at all times in order to ensure that the, the both bodies of law rem, uh, sustain their integrity. Thank you. Uh, let me just add one, one very short comment, too, on that, which is to say that the criminal standard, and again, as lawyers, I think we have to be f incredibly uh, courageous in standing up for the fidelity of the law. The criminal standard is that the commander intentionally launches an attack in the knowledge that such attack is going to cause disproportionate damage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a pretty high degree of mens rea. 
and it becomes a very fact-specific analysis for each and every strike. And I just want to pick up one, from one of the th strands this morning. This is where I don't think we as practitioners ought to have anything to fear about the proper application of the law. Um, to the extent that those are fact-specific targeting decisions, I do think the Israelis made a mistake in not being open and transparent and talking about that and demonstrating compliance and talking about the facts. And in, in, and in some instances where there was culpability, they found culpability and, and maybe they're helped by other lawyers who helped them see culpability. But in the majority of instances where there's a good faith application of that, I think they do themselves a real disservice, as do other militaries, by simply letting the perception be that anytime there's, there's uh, unfortunate consequences of an attack, that's automatically a war crime. It's not so. Thank you. I think we're running out of time here. If you have more questions, please come up and speak to the panelists afterwards. And let's just one more time thank our panelists on this discussion.